is Thor, and who I am is much less important than the simple age-old truths that have been brought to my attention over the past few years. In 2010, my wife Debbie and I lived in suburban Lancaster, California, often referred to as Compton North. At that time, the economy was hard hit by the recent loss of three quarters of a million jobs in the film industry. And you guessed it, Debbie and I were directly affected. My personal health was at an all-time low due to the brutally long, irregular hours, the extreme heat, stress, the constant driving long distances on smog-choked freeways, and the poor food choices available on lower-budget film sets. Debbie also suffered from a variety of job-related physical ailments, for which her doctors had prescribed an assortment of expensive medications. Financial hardships and health issues forced us to reevaluate our lifestyle. Growing our own natural food became the plan, but seriously, we couldn't have picked a worse location to start. The Mojave Desert, a mere 40 minutes from one of the hottest, driest places on Earth, Death Valley. With an average four months of summer temperatures reaching 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius. As we had no money to speak of and only tough desert sand to work with, the challenges facing us were huge. Despite that, we began with a homemade compost bin, a few meat rabbits, and a couple of egg-laying chickens that continuously tilled the compost. Within months, that compost was ready to add to the nutritionally barren desert sand, and a small raised bed garden was started. We began to notice that our purchases of animal feed slowed to a trickle, and the city waste pickup dropped from three full bins a week to about half a bin per month. Our critters now numbered almost 30, but the overall food bill for humans and animals was reduced by well over 50%. And in addition, our small parcel of land became a desert oasis. We had inadvertently created a complete mini ecosystem in our backyard, to the point we were now helping feed the entire area's wildlife, as well as our own critters and household. Personally, I lost 60 pounds or over 27 kilos of excess weight and at that time, being in my mid-50s, I was nearing the best physical shape of my life. Debbie's health, despite stopping her prescription medications, was overall very much improved. Whereas earlier, we simply could not afford the doctors and medications, we were now almost purposely avoiding them. Fast forward to 2015 when, after relocating to Nova Scotia with the hopes of re-establishing a small homestead, Debbie and I happened upon Mr. Frank Foster of Lyndon Lee's farm. After casually describing our experiences in California, Frank disclosed that we had merely discovered the seed, and over some time, he began to illustrate the tree. Once the tree was revealed, the full potential of the forest became painfully clear. Let me explain as best I can. That potential is full health on a regional, if not global scale. So there I was, buying some grass-fed beef and had just finished explaining our little mini ecosystem we had created in California. When Frank barked, bullshit. Say what? He continued, you haven't yet hit the mother load. The secret is in the crap, the dung, cow shit, bullshit, whatever you want to call it. Frank went on to explain that it was written in the era of Roman villa farming under the first century governor, Agricola, that 2.8 tons of farmland manure per acre are needed to replace the annual soil nutrient losses if the land wasn't grazed by ruminants, as in cattle, sheep, and goats. Nothing has changed since those early times, except the recent production of chemical fertilizers and GMOs designed for the mega farm. This quantity over quality production concept we're finding out has an inherently negative impact on all aspects of community health. Back in 1767, a full century before Confederation, by the order of the King of France, Dr. Francois Canet, one of the founders of economic theory, 
published a set of rules or maxims, which is basically a blueprint for the formation of a fair, just, and economically sustainable society. Although Kinney's 30 maxims were geared towards creating a flourishing agricultural society for the late 1700s, the rules fundamentally have not changed. The 14th of Kinney's maxims refers specifically to cattle. Let the raising and multiplication of cattle be favored, for it is they that furnish to the earth the manure that produces the richest harvests. Translated into modern English, focus your efforts on natural grazing cattle production and let their waste replenish nutrients in the soil. Thus, it was historically understood that the overall environmental benefits begin with soil health. But only now can we understand that it is the grass-fed cow manure that encourages production of good bacteria that truly benefits the soil. From the wisdom of Brown's Ranch, Bismarck, North Dakota. The soil beneath us is alive. There are more organisms in a teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on Earth. It is from this soil life that the nutrients needed to sustain higher forms of life, as in plants, animals, and people, are derived. The misuse of chemical inputs, including pesticides, chemical fertilizer, and herbicides, are detrimental to soil life, with some of the more popular options killing almost every organism in the earth. The key to improving soil health, with respect to replacing nutrients through manure, is keeping the ground covered most of the time. This is achieved with both living cover crops and crop residues to feed soil organisms and protect the soil from temperature extremes plus wind and soil erosion. A highly diverse cropping strategy keeps a living root in the soil as long as possible. The cumulative plant and grass roots are the building blocks for good soil as they allow water to penetrate easily. Soil is really a biological system. Its health provides nutrients needed to sustain life. Thus, soil health must be our focus. Stephen Schaefer, who represents the Soil Health Institute, says that pasture lands behave as cover crops, where there is something growing or covering the soil at all times. It has been proven that this helps soil retain water, carbon, and nutrients such as nitrogen. From an article in Beef Magazine referring to livestock grazing systems titled Cattle's Impact on Soil Health is Real and Valuable by Alan Newport dated November 9, 2016. The term animal impact is the cumulative effect of plant biting, saliva, urination, defecation, trampling, and all other things grazing animals do to plants and their habitat. The idea that these things can be positive can best be understood by remembering the immense herd of bison, elk, and other wild ruminants that lived and traveled across the prairie lands before cattle and sheep. The natural ways of these ruminants creates double the water capacity of what they actually use, plus a significantly high organic matter in the soils. In the last several decades, after changing the way we previously farmed, these same soils are now severely degraded all over the world. It is important to note that the concept of grass-fed livestock can optimize the carbon cycle by removing large amounts of CO2 equivalent from the atmosphere and putting it back into the soil carbon fertility every year. This suggests that those climate change advocates might look elsewhere for a culprit. Cattle, sheep, and goats that are allowed to freely roam their pastures are good for the earth and globally we reap the benefits in overall reduction in CO2s plus the very best of food. Lyndon Lee's farm in Cumberland County, Nova Scotia, which prides itself in having some of the best grass-fed beef in the county, has not used fossil fuel fertilizer in well over 15 years. This has, in some fields, doubled their soil carbon content, thus offsetting more than the fossil fuels 
burned by two average automobile vehicles annually per acre that's in use. Linden Lee's farm's grassland stewardship systems are now being recognized by a new scientific inquiry as having offset more than five times the carbon of trees or unused grass back into soil fertility. This is the mirror opposite of the systems for grain-fed meats, where soil carbon is dispersed into atmospheric CO2, or as more commonly known, greenhouse gases. And why do we really care about healthy soil? Because healthy soil promotes the growth of beneficial plants, vegetables and herbs. The resulting increase in taste, density and size of the produce from your garden is something that cannot be disputed. Unhealthy soil simply promotes the growth of weeds and other harmful plants. The choice is ours. All flesh is grass, and the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field, a pearl of wisdom spoken by Isaiah 800 years before Christ. Sunlight creates health from plant life photosynthesis being converted through the cattle and other ruminants grazing on grass and greens into flesh and fats. The latter is, in fact, a form of stored sunlight and includes vitamins A, D, E, and K2 that helps see the animals through the harsh winters. Science now proves that the beneficial bacteria in the soil, on plants, and in the gut of cattle have a close, prolonged, and favorable relationship related to the recycling of all life and fertility, including those humans who eat the stored benefits. And, although California claims that their grain-fed desert cows are happy cows, when cattle are actually raised on a salad bar of natural grasses, the meat takes on different flavors that cannot be achieved through grain. Those who promote cattle, through findings based on scientific field research, refer exclusively to naturally fed and finished beef. They do not refer to those cattle raised on grain in conjunction with hormones and additives. Free-ranging cattle, as with other wild animals, will find and naturally select to eat the types of plants that their body needs to stay strong and healthy. These naturally grass-fed cattle tend to produce meat with neutral pH levels versus the lower pH of grain-fed livestock. Higher acidity in grain-fed cattle forestomachs, or rumen, tend to promote pathogens, whereas the grass-digesting stomach produces proven anti-cancer fats, such as CLAs. Thus, healthy, strong, active, free-ranging cows need less pharmaceutical growth assistance or medical attention during their lifetime. This is extremely important for the cattle and those that feed on their meat. Taken from a Nova Scotia census from the late 1800s, when all meat was grass-fed, the cases of death by cancer in residents was a mere 26 cases for the entire province. Even a government lobbied by chemical companies, pharmaceuticals, and mega farm agriculture is starting to take note. And on June 28, 2010, the FDA publicly stated that giving animals antibiotics in order to increase food production is a threat to public health and should be stopped. Hippocrates in 400 BC stated that food is medicine, and in 400 BC, all food was natural and all livestock were free-ranging. Coincidence? I think not. Grass-fed beef is better for you, better for the planet, and better for the cows. Since we've already hinted that regular consumption of meat from naturally raised cattle 
is significantly healthier for you than the alternatives, let's review some of the evidence. The U.S. Department of Agriculture and Clemson University researchers determined the key areas where grass-fed is better than grain-fed beef for human health. In a side-by-side -side comparison, they determined that grass-fed beef was lower in fat, had a healthier ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids, as in 1.65 versus 4.84, is higher in total omega-3s, higher in beta-carotene, higher in vitamin E, higher in B vitamins, thiamine and riboflavin, higher in minerals, calcium, magnesium and potassium, higher in CLA, a proven cancer fighter, higher in vesenic acid, which can also be transformed into CLA. Some recent studies of our own local Northumberland grass-fed cattle from Frank's Linden Lee's farm indicate that even greater results can be achieved, especially with regard to CLAs and the omega-3 to 6 ratio. Just let herbivores be herbivores and cooperate with nature instead of fighting it. This is a different and refreshing philosophy, which leads to a significant reduction in health care costs. From a health website, take care of your body now. A healthy diet full of nutrient-dense foods drives down health care costs. Always buy foods in their natural state versus those pre-packaged foods. A healthy lifestyle will not only drive down health care costs, but it allows us to feel more energized with an increased sense of well-being. This is an excerpt from an article by Joseph Hiblin, MD, a captain in the United States Public Health Service. The Lewin Group, in 2007, calculated the costs of giving everyone over the age of 65 two grams of omega-3s a day for the prevention of heart disease. And it turns out that you save about $44,000 per person by treating everyone over the age of 65 with cardiovascular disease with omega-3 fatty acids. So for a healthcare provider, healthcare insurance company, or on a provincial scale, what you can save potentially translates into hundreds of millions of dollars in healthcare costs in Nova Scotia alone. CLAs and omega-3s seem to be the key to fighting disease and allowing a body to run at maximum potential. The recommended daily intake of 750 milligrams of omega-3s is easily achieved on a beef diet, with beef giving even salmon a run for its money. The addition of beef CLAs and omega-3s provide the liquid fats that act as antifreeze in cattle and humans flowing to the extremities and to the neurons in the brain. The real potential for Nova Scotia is a two-thirds reduction in healthcare costs just by eating grass-fed beef. Healthy people simply don't require the same level of care. Thus, barring government, big pharma, insurance company, union, and medical profession opposition, the need for staffed facilities, support personnel, insurance, and expensive medications would be thus greatly reduced. Just think of a high-performance engine that runs much better and longer on premium fuel and regular oil changes than on salt water or sewer sludge, despite all the possible additives and constant repairs. Current Nova Scotia healthcare costs average over 6,000 per person yearly and is three times the cost of food at 2,000 per person and many times the cost of beef in the diet. At only four or five dollars per pound of grass-fed beef, 100% of the nutrients a body requires is thus provided. In days gone by, the average person in Britain consumed two pounds of meat daily just to maintain the energy needed to complete a full day's labor. In the book, The Big Fat Surprise, a New York Times bestseller by Nina Tichaltz, she references a study by the Chief Medical Officer of the Western Railroad of Bombay, S. L. Malhorta, 
Malhorta studied the health of over one million of India's railway workers during the mid-1960s over a five-year period and found that those from the northern areas that ate eight times more dairy fat in their diet lived an average of 12 years longer and suffered eight times less heart disease than their co-workers from the south that avoided fat. To further the cause for grass-fed beef, articles by Dr. Walls highlight the gut-to-brain connection and hint at a cure for multiple sclerosis. Also from the Detroit News published on June 5th, 2018 in an article titled Don't Manage Diabetes, Reverse It by Sarah Hallberg. Diabetes is reversible. That's the exciting conclusion of a health study at Indiana University where 262 patients with type 2 diabetes recently completed one year of a clinical trial examining the impact of a low carbohydrate diet which limits foods like grains and pasta while boosting consumption of healthy fats. It is important to note that the diet did not restrict calories and the results are now in. A full 94% of patients on the low-carb intervention have been able to reduce or eliminate their need for insulin. For 60% of patients, their average blood sugar levels fell so low that technically they have reversed their diabetes. And let's be clear, diabetes is a public health emergency. Today, more than 30 million Americans suffer from some form of diabetes, and that number has been rising for decades. The illness is the nation's seventh leading cause of death. The other serious side effects of diabetes include heart disease, nerve and kidney damage, limb amputation, and blindness. Last year alone, diabetes cost the United States about $327 billion in medical bills and lost productivity. Other articles by Natasha Campbell McBride establish a connection between gut and human psychology. It seems you are what you eat in ways deeper than previously expected. An article in the New England Journal of Medicine by the Health Project Consortium titled Reducing healthcare costs by reducing the need and demand for medical services promotes the common sense consumption of natural foods rich in nutrients and the avoidance of harmful habits like smoking. Reducing Nova Scotia's healthcare costs can be as simple as that. And from these and other studies, we conclude that the ideal cattle farmer should target no pesticides, no herbicides, and no antibiotics. And lastly, a stroke of genius from a study by the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College. Does staying healthy reduce your lifetime health care costs? Their conclusion, the healthy can expect to live longer than the unhealthy. Much of the agriculture in Nova Scotia is either for the bulk market as it is for blueberries or smaller farms that specialize. Smaller farms can offer better selections and higher quality products, but often use more manpower. This need for manpower can lead to full employment in many of our rural sectors. I've yet to hear of a farm or business for that matter that is not in need of some help. Another factor is Kinney's multiplier effect and the creation of related industries. In its simplest terms, a farmer does not exist without his community. He needs supplies and the market. The farmer's constant need for supplies creates opportunity for new local entrepreneurs and his produce is the raw material for a host of other value-added businesses. From tooling specialists, building construction, restaurants, butcher shops, to the seasonal labor force, these are just some of the opportunities that can be made available to our rural landscape. Now let's consider investment and opportunities. Whereas an empty piece of nutritionally depleted agricultural land in the Niagara Peninsula seems to average three quarters of a million dollars for a mere five acres, 
Nova Scotia is flush with $1,000 per acre opportunities. Then consider the exodus of money leaving Nova Scotia as a result of buying our beef from elsewhere. If we estimate just our hamburger consumption of 50 million pounds at $5 per pound, that translates into $250 million leaving the province annually, never to return. Using Kinney's multiplier effect, this represents a $1.5 billion loss to the province. Now estimate the cost of grain feed, water and soil depletions, transportation costs, and carbon emissions from a single truckload of beef from Alberta, and you can see where this is going. Can we really afford this? And as for taxes, a circa year 2000 study indicates that farm direct expenditures of 327 million in Nova Scotia generated 853 million in total Canadian GDP and 310 million in total government tax revenues both provincial and federal. This means that for every dollar spent by farmers in Nova Scotia, governments collect 95 cents in tax. By buying locally, employment opportunities are increased, which in turn helps the local economy. Let's benefit from the experience of history. Take a look at some excerpts and recommendations from Protecting and Preserving Agricultural Land in Nova Scotia the latest policy framework submitted by the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture. Well-planned communities attract jobs and investments and are guided by the general principles of prosperity, sustainability, livability, and the uniqueness of the local community. Agriculture is important to local communities, but farmers face significant challenges from increasing pressures of growth and development and from municipal bylaws that may encumber agricultural practices. A farmer's greatest asset is land. When financial concerns are not an issue, farmland and surrounding areas typically remain in agricultural production. But when money is an issue, the local community could be affected by potential land conversion. Currently, Nova Scotia does not have a definite policy on the protection of agricultural lands and land use planning falls under the responsibility of the municipalities. When losing agricultural land to developing or rezoning, we must consider that a farm is much more than just land. The levels of agricultural activity that arise from a new farm development or existing farm expansion must be taken into account. The government's latest policy framework recommendations are not new revelations at all. The clear message throughout the study echoes the same wisdom of Dr. Francois Canet and his maxims published in 1767, a full century before Confederation. For those not familiar, his maxims address the authority of government, trade with other nations, imports, exports, pricing, investment, taxation, property rights, and first and foremost, the importance of agriculture to the economic prosperity of a nation. His maxims also dealt with the subjects of personal liberty, land ownership, the economic balance between rich and poor, overall fairness amongst citizens, and above all, the dangers of excessive government taxation and public debt. Francois Canet knew that the most important factor to a stable growing economy and a fair and just society was agriculture. Agriculture is still the key to full employment and food self-sufficiency is a core element that other industries need to thrive. His ideas have been adopted by a multitude of world leaders, including the founding fathers of the United States of America. Let the nation never lose sight of the fact that the earth is the sole source of all riches and that it is agriculture which multiplies these riches. Kinney believed that only the agricultural sector could produce a surplus that could be then used to produce more the next year, as in animal offspring and plant seeds, and these, therefore, help perpetuate growth. Farming done in this sustainable manner can be incredibly beneficial to the community's health. 
This method of agriculture generates complementary income streams for the small farmer and allows them to compete with the concentrated animal feeding operations of the mega farms while protecting our valuable lands from ecological disasters. Eventually, over the last 70 years, hundreds of thousands of acres of pastoral farmland have been derelict despite a tripling of Nova Scotia's population since Confederation in 1867. Annually, Nova Scotia now imports over 90% of its food, including the beef requirement, with hundreds of millions of dollars going to the benefit of other provinces and foreign countries. What is wrong with this picture? Grass-fed beef is not only the most nutrient-dense food for human health, but the natural ways of cattle recycle life itself through billions of beneficial bacteria and microorganisms. This is accomplished via the annual greening with the sunlight stored in plants returned to the soil while being cycled through all life forms in the area. Countless generations connected to the land have understood the symbiotic relationship with cattle converting vegetation, not palatable to humans, into food leading to the general wealth of a region. By replacing imported beef, we can diminish transportation costs benefiting both animals and the environment. This reduces carbon and healthcare costs many times the actual food value. Create wealth and sustain your own by first selecting food that's homegrown. Buy local, safe, secure food grown right here in Nova Scotia. It's in your best interest. And when someone asks you, so what's your beef? Just say, grass-fed or nothing. <laughs>